OK, so welcome back. Um, just a quick thought from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. OK, Hosea 10, verse 12, let me read it. It says, uh, sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. And if you, you know, if you see it, a lot of um, reference to agriculture, plowing, reaping, etc. In the in the verses following that, also, I just want to like turn our attention to that uh, particular phrase: "Break up your fallow ground." So, fallow ground is ground that is uncultivated. Fallow fallow ground is a ground which has a um, lot of potential, but it's lying uncultivated. Like it's not been touched for whatever purpose. It's it's got potential, but it's not cultivated. Okay, so that kind of a thing. So here comes the instruction: break up your fallow ground. Break up meaning till it, prepare the land um, so that it can be used. Okay, so um, and the, uh, and the, uh, we see that it says sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, and so on. So so what the question is: what is our fallow ground? You know. Um, Maybe there are certain aspects of our life where we have, uh, where we know, you know, maybe it's an area of gifting, maybe it's an area of ability, maybe uh, it's a, it's an undiscovered place, undiscovered potential. Uh, but you know that, hey, that's not been used. Right? It's, it's lying waste. And the Lord's instruction is break up that fallow ground, you know, prepare it. It is hardened. No seed can actually fall and take root. Uh, it needs to be prepared. So, um, whatever you know that we need to do uh, in order to prepare that aspect of our life, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, in context of whatever we are doing with learning about life skills, you know, what what aspect of these things uh, do we need to kind of prepare ourselves for, uh, so that they can be the sowing of the Lord, they can be a reaping, and so on, right? So, so as we pray, let's uh, let's just ask the Lord, Lord. Uh, what is my fallow ground? What is it that's lying unused um, and neglected? And, and uh, it it has potential. People have said, God, you have said, uh, but it's still lying unused. It's still lying. Um, so, yeah, let's ask the Lord, right? Okay, let's pray. Father, we, we come before you, Lord, and uh, we have this question, Lord, we, that you would show uh, what is our fallow ground, God, uh, something that's so much potential below the surface, but um, it needs to be prepared. Uh, there needs to be some work on it. And um, Lord, we pray that you would show us what it is, um, that what, what it is that we need to do, God, in order to prepare that, in order to break up that fallow ground. And I just pray, Lord, that... Uh, Lord, that you would, um, Lord, enable us, Lord, by the by your word and by the work of your spirit, that our hearts will be prepared, Lord, that this aspect or area of our lives will be prepared, Lord, to receive the word of God, to receive the reign of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we do not want it to be far, fallow, O oh God. We want to, Lord, receive this your seed, the seed of your word, to, um, to really bear fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold, O oh God. Yes, Master, we commit ourselves into your mighty hands. We pray that you'll continue to, Lord, lead us into this truth. And um, so that everything that is hardened, everything that is lying unused, Lord, will be turned, prepared uh, for your touch and for your glory. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing with the life skills. Um, yeah, hello to those who joined us during the prayer. Okay, I'm just going to share the notes now. And... Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So today we're going to look at uh, money management. Yeah. So we might say, okay, I wish I had more of it so I could manage it. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is to manage it when, even when uh, it's in it's in short supply, or maybe it's not as um, there's not uh, as much money as as we would wish, as we would want. Um, but to to be able to have a strategy for managing money, to be able to um, 
um, have some information on what I can do with it. Right. So money is again, uh, money is not evil. Money is not something that is, uh, you know, that's a curse. Um, uh, in order to have money, it's not something that you need to feel guilty about. We need money to function, to work in this world. And uh, and the Bible has a lot to talk about finances. We know that. We've learned in that other course, financial stewardship. So we, we know what God's heart is towards money, and uh, we should have the same thing as well, right? So, so in this chapter, we're going to look at a few practical aspects of managing money yeah, some things that we can um, some things that we can put in place maybe you're already doing it oh, that's it'll be a reiteration of that okay. so the first thing is budgeting okay so budgeting simply put okay, it is how we plan uh, it is a plan where we where we say okay this is how I'm going to spend my money okay even if it's let's say 500 rupees or whatever, you know, you're, you're deciding, okay, this is how I'm going to spend it. So it's a plan. So we plan ahead and say, these are, this is my income. These are my expenses. And therefore, here's the plan. This is how I'm going to spend it. Okay. So what is our income? Okay. Income to a person who's salaried would be the monthly salary. Income to a businessman would be you know, whatever he or she comes uh, or gets through the business. And it can be a regular flow coming in, you know, maybe daily um, as and when payments come in from clients uh, to the services rendered or products sold. And it could be that um, uh, income in terms of people who are in ministry could be tithes and offerings coming in and uh, um, and where uh, where you decide, OK, this is my salary. Okay, this coming into the church, the church account, and then the board decides or you decide that this is this amount is going to be my salary to take care of my expenses, right? So, so that's the income. Now, maybe you're not a working person, maybe you're a student, um, and it could be your income would be what um, what is being you know given to you through parents or guardians or whoever's uh, you know sponsoring your studies. So, income is what you receive, right? So. So that is the um, income that we get. So it could be, um, there could be a duration of frequency through which we get our income. Right? It could be, it could be weekly. It could be, you know, okay, one lump sum which we get for managing our expenses for the next six months, right? Um, like if you're a student, maybe, you know, the parents or guardians say, okay, this, you take care of this for the next semester, this, this amount. It could be that, or it could be coming at various frequency. So, it, it, it's important to know the frequency with which you get, and so you can decide how you're going to plan for it, right? Okay. So when we are planning, uh, it is good to be meticulous. So just want to say that uh, the plan can be uh, it time consuming, right? It'll involve certain uh, thinking through, and uh, maybe we are, you know some of us enjoy that. Most of us don't. Right, spending that time, but but once we do it, it'll be it can be a template. It can be something that we can follow through. It doesn't have to change drastically every time, right? So, okay, so uh, we need to work. Now, having worked on the income, the next thing is to work on or list down what is our essential expenditure and essential sorry essential expenditure on certain things that have a fixed price on it. Okay, so essential expenditure for uh, for us. How what are some things? You now it could be our accommodation, right, or rent. Um, these are essential. These don't fluctuate. The price doesn't fluctuate. It's a fixed thing, right? Whether you're staying in it or not, if you're actually, you know, uh, planned out your accommodation, you need. There's so much amount that goes out every month as rental or maybe as a lease. Um, you know, and uh, if it is a, uh, if you're repaying a loan you know, or EMI or mortgage, whatever, you know, so all this, uh, it, it could be there. Then there are some bills like electricity, water, um, the bill for your internet, your phone, you know, all these are bills. And uh, these also, most cases, these are fixed, right? So these are fixed. 
Uh, along with that, expenditures also could be um, something uh, like insurance, like insurance for the vehicle. Maybe there's a life insurance, that policy that you've taken. Um, so these are our fixed price, um, or, or what, what we would call as a fixed overhead, right? Rentals and payments and so on, right? So these are something. So it's good to list these out and say, OK, these are my fixed overheads. These are my expenses. The next one is to list down what are factor in, what are non-fixed, right? What could be actually varying month on month? Maybe it could be. You know, well, on a certain month, maybe there's uh, the food expenses go up because the food cost is more, or you're eating out more, right? The food cost goes up, um, and then um, maybe travel. You know, some sometimes maybe you you have to travel more, and therefore um, that goes up. That's a variable again, right? So so things like that. Um, so the best thing to do whenever we are uh, listing down these expenses is to take and you know take the history. Okay, so we are not actually saying projecting. Okay, this is how it will be. But you look at the history. You look at the last six months, the last one year, and you look at okay, what has been my expenses? So that will actually give a clear picture. Uh, we can even arrive at an average. Um, and so, that, so it's it's good to look at the history. So so there's no guesswork, right? Because this is what you've actually spent on. And, and uh, the thing is, this is what you will in the future also. If you're continuing in the same place, same lifestyle, um, so it, it's more or less it's going to be the same. There could be variations, but most likely it's going to remain the same, right? So it's good to look at the history. So whenever we look at budgets, we look at the past, and then we factor in what could be some changes what could be certain things that we are new things, new ventures that we could be going into, and because of which uh, we factor in those costs also. Okay, so it's good to look at the past. So the thing is, okay, I've not really kept track. <laughs> you know, I just spent as money came. I spent. I lived for the day sufficient until the days the trouble thereof. Uh, you know, and all those verses I misquoted and. <laughs> And so I don't know. OK, so no problem. In that case, we need to actually look at what, you know, take a month, maybe the just the previous month. What is it? Just look back and see what is it that I spent. Okay, Maybe it will, it, more or less, it could be fresh uh, in our memory. We might miss out on a few things. But that will help us. OK, so, um, so make that, um, list that down as the expenses. If the other thing to do, next thing to do is to, so actually delete our expenditure from the income. Okay, So this is the income that I'm getting. This is the expenditure. So I subtract the expenditure from the income. And hopefully, it is there's some amount you know left behind. If not, also it's OK, right? Because um, it's not you're not going to remain in the same place. You're not going to be remaining in the same place of um, income. Okay, so as long as you are faithful, as long as you are, you know, working faithfully, um, the Lord will bring increase. Okay, the Lord will bring increase. You know, if so, um, so not to worry about that, right? So, subtract that the uh, from the income. So you you get what is called as a you know as a um, discretionary amount, miscellaneous. Right, so this can go into savings. This can be set aside for maybe emergencies or, or you know, uh, unplanned expenses. We can use for that. Right. So this is a very simple, um, simple uh, formula or simple template that we can use. Okay. So that miscellaneous, you can decide. Okay. Am I going to save it? If so, how? Okay. How can I save it? Can I put it in a like a fixed deposit where um, you know banks have that or can it be a recurring deposit where there's a payment that i make every month and where the return is more or if my you know discretionary in or amount is more right uh, my salary levels are high where can i invest it 
right? Do I invest in land? Do I invest in uh, maybe some shares? Uh, all these are possible, right? So uh, I just wanted to you know just uh, remind us that uh, we are being good stewards of it, so that your our needs are taken care of, your personal needs are taken care of, so that you can take care of others' needs also. And you can use it for kingdom purposes, as the Lord will lead. You know, for for each person, the Lord has you know will lead in a certain way personally, and so you can use for that. So no need, there's no need to feel guilty uh, when we think of saving, right? So many people think uh, you know maybe I should not be thinking about it. it's a it's a it's a worldly thing to think about you know saving and all that but the but the lord you know we see in Proverbs, go to the ants go to the ants and learn what are they doing they are working hard but they're also saving for the winter months when they are, they will no no longer be able to go and find food like how it is in summer so which means that there's a change in environment there's a change in situation there's a change in season um, and so you're preparing be beforehand for that season. So there's nothing wrong in preparing. So it's scriptural, right? Um, so when we read through Proverbs, there's so much wisdom on how the simple, uh, you know, or the, uh, how the simple just pass on and then they, they bear the consequences of it. But the prudent weigh the matter, weigh their decisions, right? So we can use wisdom. We can, um, uh, you know, see what is what is ethical right what is uh, is, is we're not you know, gambling or anything but what is ethical in order to save what is ethical in order to multiply what the lord has put in our money uh what does the lord has put in our hands right okay most important thing let's learn to live with what we have in that particular season okay in that particular season how can i use this this X amount of money that I have, uh, how can my lifestyle, you know, um, adapt to this? Or you know, I don't want to ex uh, want my expenditure to be extravagant when there is no income coming in, there's no money coming in, right? So if that is the case, what would happen is that I will I will most likely end up borrowing, taking a loan, right, to take care of the essential expenditure. And that's not a situation we want to be in, right? Because at the same time, we know that whatever we borrow, it has to be paid back. It has to be paid back with interest. And uh, if it if, uh, if it is um, like a um, loan that is taken, like a cash loan uh, from money lenders, it is with very high interest, right? So it has its consequences. Um, yes, there are certain cases where we where we take a loan, where we borrow, uh, maybe for certain ex big expend expenditures, like maybe you're buying a house, or maybe there's a vehicle that needs to be bought, or things like that, or land, or whatever, um, where you make a plan and say, okay, monthly so much is required to pay back. Can I afford it? Can the essential expenditures, the fixed and the variable, can that be taken care of? Right, very important. Because if that cannot be managed, then it's it's going to be a spiral, a never-ending spiral of chasing money in order to pay the creditor. Right. So um, that's that's not a situation we need to be in. Uh, we don't have to put ourselves in that place. So uh, so the simple rule of thumb is: okay, this is how much I'm getting. What changes can I make? Now, we need to understand that it's not going to be forever. It could be for a season. It could be for a time. But you know, you understand that. With that in mind, you know, I know that season is going to change. I know that the income levels will change. But with this, what I'm getting, can I live my life? Can I change suitably change my lifestyle so that I can live within the means, so that I don't have to go borrow by the end of the month uh, for what are essential, right? OK. Now, there will always be inducements. There will always be a sale. There will always be a, you know, uh, uh, easy payback method. 
uh, but don't be swayed by it unless it's a necessity you know especially when you go online amazon has a sale you know there's an independent sale there's a whatever you know there's no there's, there's always a sale there's always some just think about it you know do i need this gadget do i need this phone uh, what's wrong with the one that i have right uh, is it does it serve the purpose and so you know do that right okay any questions no questions um anything from the online students any questions at all um of course we're not going into um the details the specifics like we did in financial management but you know the you know the broad premise or the foundation based on which you know we we say we share this right when it comes to money okay um yeah so i would also say you know maybe if there's a workshop where you live maybe there's something happening online uh, um you know on christian professionals um something on handling of finances and so on uh, it'll be a good idea to do that right to uh, to learn more to see what are the avenues that are possible because many times we are uh, we are ignorant of the avenues for even saving for even making our money work right so these are some things that we can learn when we attend a workshop when we do a course online um so be open to do that and um, yeah so don't think of it as worldly uh, it is not right as long as our intentions are clear right uh, as long as our you know our we are not putting our trust in uncertain riches right but we are trusting in the living god who gives us all richly all things to enjoy right we see that in timothy so that's the guiding principle right okay um okay so let's look at uh, another aspect which is management of people okay so people management is also a skill okay as managing time managing money so also when it comes to dealing or interacting with people managing people right that is also a skill to be learned while um we see that money time and people are resources right so we use people like we use things well they are resources they are precious um but when it comes to you know our ministry when it comes to the workplace um we need to have the skill in order to um in order to work alongside and also to um you know also to lead right a lot of it we saw in christian leadership um this will be um some of those key things that we learned there we can look at so we we see that none of us are an island we need to interact with people especially when it comes to ministry people are whom we are reaching out right and uh, when we reach out we don't do that solo there's always you know there's the body and right? there are others whom god sends alongside who speak into our lives whose lives we speak into and we work together as a team we see that the lord jesus when he sent out people he sent them out two by two right and we see the teams becoming even more complex as we go through the epistles we see paul's team paul and silas and you know they that that's how they start off uh, sorry paul and barnabas but then we see that there's john mark who comes in there's timothy who's there and then when we read romans uh, the last chapter we see the whole lot of people whom paul was connected with whom paul was interacting with and so uh, you know so we see that yes uh, people um there's no running away from people right and we need to be able to work alongside and work um uh, lead people as well right so um when we uh, when we study teams we saw that when it comes to people when we have more people there are more resources right when we consider pe people as resources yes you know we because each person brings fresh ideas fresh set of skills okay now i might be strong in certain areas i might not be able to do everything okay but here comes someone who's strong in certain areas where i 
I may not have that necessary expertise nor the skill. Right? So what happens is there's synergy. Right? So their skill, along with my calling, gifting, abilities, put together, there's major impact. There's great impact. The things that uh, you know that that was a challenge, it was a struggle to get things done, now becomes a little more easier. It's more streamlined because of certain people in the team. Right? So, so there's always, you know, there's always um, benefit. It's always fruitful when we work together as a team. So there's there's beauty and there's impact high impact when it comes to ministering in teams right at the same time if not done well right it can actually pull down and uh, end up in a big mess because there are more people are involved right so that is something that we need to keep in mind so uh, in order to have high impact it's good to work with teams and that we see as a blueprint in scripture as well so uh, Maybe there's certain skills we have naturally, but what are those skills that we need to have? Okay. Um, first thing is, uh, let's just list down a few things, like organizing, organizing people, delegating to people, right? Motivating people, motivating the team, then evaluating or assessing the, the effectiveness, uh, the impact, everything. Okay. So first one is organizing. Okay, so how do we organize people around a common goal? I think we've learned it earlier, but also to have a clear vision. Okay, to have a clear vision, to make sure that okay, let me just put it on the chat to to have that um, vision that is clear. Okay, to make sure that the vision is clear, the vision is communicated. The vision is reiterated, and everyone is moving towards the same vision. Okay, so everybody knows. Okay, this is what we are going after. Right, this is what we are going after. This is what we are called to achieve. So when the vision is clear, when the direction is clear, when the tasks that we need to do are clear, then everybody is able to focus everybody is able to put their energy and effort uh, after that particular task okay so if there's no clarity then there is no um, then the 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 task uh, there's there's no effort or enough effort is not put in because you're not sure oh do i do this or do i do that you're in two minds you know is it is it good am i supposed to do it there's no clarity, right? But if there is clarity, when you know for sure you're doing the right thing, you know, this is the right thing, I need to put in effort, I need to put in energy into this, um, it's OK to do this, then you will go all out uh, and put wholehearted effort. Okay. So imagine having a team that's really working hard and putting in wholehearted uh, effort towards the same thing, right? That results results in movement towards the whatever uh, whatever destination you have, whatever thing you need to achieve. Right. So organizing. So organizing. One is the vision. The second thing is how do we get these people? Right. How do we get the people? So several ways. If there are people already in the system or in the environment that you are environment we can say ministry we can say it's a workplace right uh, we can say it's uh, maybe a church right? if the people are already there so the thing is to envision them right envision them towards a particular task okay um, get them or uh, you know uh, get their okay get their consent in other words we're saying they are buying in saying yeah I want to God told me the same thing this is what we are going after, and I'm in. I'm signing up for it. I'm in. You know, just like the mighty men of David, you know, they said, uh, "Are you here?" You know, David asked them, "Are you here to? You know, are you for me?" And they said, "Yes. This is what you know, we will do. This for you." Okay. So when there's buy-in, when there's loyalty, when there's commitment, um, then 
everything starts moving. Okay, so that's the first um, that I would say would, would be the you know uh, second step. So vision is clear, then there is commitment um, to move in, right? But what happens if people are not there? Then there has to be a method or process to um, to to get to invite, right? Invite people towards the cause. Invite the people towards the towards the mission, whatever it is, towards the assignment, right? So you, uh, in practical terms, it would be, if it's a job, it would be a job interview. And you call for an interview and say, hey, this is what we are. This is who we are. This is our vision. And uh, so are you interested? If you have these skills, if you have these abilities, then we'd like you to sign up. Why don't you sign up? Why don't you, you know, we can do this together. So it's a, it's a um, invitation for an interview where we, where we talk, find out, maybe test the abilities. Um, the interview is also a, a, the right thing, right uh, time to, you know, see what the motivations are, right? Because people could sign up for the interview for very, various things. You know, it's okay. You know, I don't really agree with it, but I need something. I need to do something with my time. I need some money. Uh, I don't really agree with it, but I let me just sign up anyway, right? So interview is a, a opportunity to check the motivation, to find out if it's real, to find out what the what the heart's passions are, find out what the call is, um, to find out what whatever is there on the resume, whether it's true, whether it's so an interview, you know, whether you're doing it on the phone, whether you're doing it online or in person, it helps to really um, uh, reaffirm or uh, reassure yourself that this is these things are true, these things are that this is the right person for the job, and so on, right? So uh, organize, right? Uh, get people in, envision them, get them committed. There is also an aspect of equipping. Okay, so. People come with basic skills and abilities. Um, okay, I, I'll uh, probably add this to the notes and put it up later. Um, so I, I think I'll do that. Yeah. So there's also this aspect of equipping. Okay. So people come in with basic skill sets, basic abilities, and maybe the job that is required, uh, job that is required to be done, needs an upgrade in skills but the skills which they have at the moment is maybe enough for them to learn right and you have the uh, you have the uh, privilege of giving some time so that they can learn they can be skilled uh, they can be trained in order to take that up so um, so that is also another aspect of organizing people around tasks around a common goal, right? Um, so you're training them, equipping them. And as part of the equipping, you're also giving them the equipment that is required. What are the tools that are required to get the job done? OK, so that's another aspect of organizing. So here are some people. Maybe they are in the Department of Finance. Do they have the skills? Do they need an upgrade in skills? with these basic skills um, with regard to technology, with regard to whatever you know, software package that they will be using for accounting. Uh, and also, do they have the necessary equipment? Do they know, you know, do they need a laptop? Do they need a whatever accounting software package to be installed in that? Do they have the know-how to operate it? Okay, so these are all things, you know, simple things like if you're a cook, you know to know, OK, do I have the necessary equipment? Do I have the stove? Do I have the microwave? Do I have the you know, things like that? Do I have the enough dishes? Do I have enough spoons? Um, you know, do I have the ingredients? Right. So think in those terms, you know, how can I get these people organized? Um, because we are, we want them, the expectation is wanting them to do a good job. But unless we organize um, people around the task, around the common goal, and give them the necessary things required to finish the task and do it well, um, it's going to result in frustration. Right? You are frustrated. They are frustrated. And it's it's not a good start. So organizing people. So think through and say, what is it? What kind of people do I need? 
to have? Where can I look for them? Do I look internally? Do I look outside? If it's outside, how do I invite them, right, to be part of this mission? Um, and then, uh, what do I what do I assist them on, right? Skills, abilities, qualities, characteristics, and then, are they uh, do they have the same heart for the vision and so on, right? And then, the equipping part. Um, so, so that is how we organize, right? And organize around tasks. So organize around, let's say, departments or certain core areas. Okay? So it could be, like we said, finances. It could be um, maybe outreach. It could be media, right? It could be uh, maybe creative work like design. So organize people around that. Okay. There could be some who are multi-skilled, right? Uh, and maybe for a season of time, they can actually take care of multiple things. But when the work grows or when the workload grows, you cannot expect the same kind of, we cannot expect the same kind of efficiency or the same kind of results. Why? Because the workload is more, the time taken is more, um, and they need to deliver within that same time. Um, you know, the quality differs, right? So, if we, that is the thing, if people are multi-skilled, then for a season they take, they can take care of multiple things. But as be mindful, as things grow, then maybe we need to add another person uh, to that particular thing so that it's done well, right? So organizing people, okay. The second one is delegation, okay. Delegating of tasks, okay. So these are things that you have on your plate, okay. You have on your list. Now, how do you delegate it? How do you give it and ask the person to do it, okay? So um, any thoughts how to delegate or how not to delegate? Paul delegated, right? Um, I think um, we're doing a book study on Thessalonians in church, so we see that Paul delegates some responsibility to Timothy. Right? He asks them to go to Thessalonica, find out how they're doing, come back with the information. He delegates while he himself goes to Athens. Right? So when we, look, when we look at delegating, we look at capability of the person. Is that person the right job, right person for this, for this task? Because what are you when you delegate, you're handing over, right? You're handing, I'm sorry, you're handing over a particular task, a particular responsibility, and you're saying, do this, right? Um, so I, I want this to be done. So the first thing is, do they have the, um, do they have the ability, right? Do they have the ability to do it? Um, for example, um, like when Paul writes to Timothy uh, about certain responsibilities, so he says, uh, you know, this is, these are some things that you need to look for, right? He says, uh, talking about characteristics, he talks about ability, right? he, like First Timothy chapter three, a lot of characteristics there. I mean, character, a lot of emphasis on character, and um, even about deacons, a lot of emphasis on character, and also about ability. So. Considering all that, considering the task at hand, is the person the right person for this job? Okay, very important question. Because if you're delegating to the wrong person, and if it's a very critical job, critical task, then there are going to be ex consequences, right? Um, Paul also talks about uh, how he says, um, First Timothy 3 and verse 6, he says, not a novice, Less being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Okay, so this is a spiritual delegation uh, or spiritual uh, leader whom they are appointing. So he says, uh, all the among all the things he said, not a novice means um, not someone who is uh, with who's new to the faith, maybe who's uh, got very less experience, right? For this particular task, so he's made that assessment. You no, know, this this person should be a mature person. It cannot be a novice. Now, yes, novices can be given certain tasks with the training and everything, but it could not, it cannot be this task, right? Uh, which which requires certain capabilities. So, which means that we assess and see is the person we assess the task 
we assess the person and then say is the right person for the task and then we ask them to do it okay we can also start by giving delegating tasks that are not too mission critical okay so what do we mean by that which means that if they fail it's going to have disastrous consequences right it's going to have big impact uh, the failure of that so when you're delegating maybe for the first time you know uh, to someone for that person it's the first time that they're handling these things uh, always um, delegate certain things which are not so critical find out the strength find out how they do it right uh, so the maybe the critical things the which things which are of most importance which have a lot of you know uh, if things don't go well that's going to have a bad consequence you can handle it yourself okay but Maybe certain things to find out the strength, find out the uh, ability with which they do it, and then we can entrust them with more. Okay, so the the temptation is to do that task yourself. Okay, because it's uh, it is difficult when you delegate, and maybe uh, you know you cannot take your hands off. Initially, we need to monitor. We need to see how they are doing give some kind of a course correction which means it's double the work now you know, you're doing it you're doing some other task you have handed over this task but then you need to monitor initially at least monitor to see how they're doing it do they need some more input some direction some correction right and then monitor that as well so it's going to take a lot out of us initially when we delegate so that's why many people say, OK, I don't want to delegate. I'll just do it myself. Forget it. You know, I'll just do it myself. Um, you know, and then we, uh, we end up not delegating. We end up carrying a lot of things ourselves and not uh, giving it to others. So other people can grow. Other people can get, definitely make use of opportunities. They can grow. Uh, they, can thrive. they can be an asset. You know, they can be a great help, a great encouragement, a great support if we delegate it well. Right? So we delegate. We also assess or evaluate and monitor and see how well are they doing. Um, example, you know, when we have, like, let's say, a worship team or somebody's preaching, um, we always give feedback and say, OK, hey, here are some good things. You did well. OK, you came on time. You prepared. And you did these things. Here are some things that can be done better. OK, so, um, next time, just make sure um you you also cover these things you know this could be done better and hey these areas uh, maybe you didn't even think about it but um these are pretty uh, important areas you need to get that right you know these were wrong this didn't come at the right time so we need to do it right so some feedback like that will always help so how am i able to give feedback only when i monitor right only when i see okay how is that person doing it what is the end so um, so we're not micromanaging and say, okay, every step, no, but we, we delegate, we, we do monitor. Okay. Um, so then, then, then it becomes a, so that person, when what happens is when the person is sincere, uh, they don't have any problem with the ability. They don't have every problem with the attitude. Okay. They're most likely to succeed. Okay. When we give valuable feedback, uh, after delegating, they are more likely to succeed and they will do well. They will be a source of strength. Okay. Third thing, motivating. Okay. Motivating people towards the common ground. So people being people, people not being machines, uh, have limited energy, are also susceptible to certain distract distractions, um, and also have life challenges. Right. We need to we need to understand that they have ups and downs. Right? They they are people with emotions. They have ups and downs. They have families. They face challenges, and and all that happens. So, uh, which means that uh, when we are working towards a particular thing, if people are not really contributing, there's a reason. Okay? The reason could be they don't know how to do it. The reason could be they don't want to do it. Now, that's a matter of attitude. Okay? It's not a matter of learning. I don't want to do it. 
The other things could be I'm unable to do it, even though I sk have the skill, I have the ability. Right now, I'm not able to do it because some things are challenging me. Emotionally, I'm being challenged. I'm being discouraged. So many times we see Paul writing to the church to encourage. Right? Peter writing to encourage. Right? Um, for example, um, I think it was Peter who says, you know, don't consider it strange that you're going through these fiery trials. Right? Is that Peter? Um, or is it uh, James? Yeah, so yeah, so Peter says, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so so he says, um, yeah, don't think it's strange. Now, this is actually about uh, verse five, is it? No, verse four. Um, yeah, so he says another place where he says that. Um, four twelve, but I can't. OK, OK. Yeah, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings and so on. So he's really, uh, I thank you for that. Um, so he's really encouraging. He's, uh, you know, so he does that. So so there is uh, that place of motivation, motivating, encouraging, inspiring, right? You just put all that together. Uh, in order to, um, in order to go, go after the thing. So people get tired, people get distracted, people get um, you know challenged, and they want to give up because of various things happening in their lives. So so be aware of that. Okay. So as a as a leader or as a as a person who needs to improve on people's skills, who needs to build the people's skills, this is another one thing to take care of. So. Things won't be automatic. Just because we have taken a highly, highly skilled person, highly motivated person, maybe, person with great attitude, we cannot take it for granted that they will always be firing. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, doing really well and just going full speed. No, because they are people. Right? So there is that place where we need to find out why things are not happening. Um, and then motivate them, encourage them, right? And and you will be very surprised when they know that hey, the person whom I'm working with understands. Um, he um, so he's he's on my side and he's willing to, you know, uh, go with me on this, willing to understand why I'm doing this. Then they'll actually do even better, right? Um, a couple of other things, evaluation. OK, we looked at that. The last thing is the letting go part. You know, There are times when people have to be let go. Okay. Many reasons. Why? Because maybe the scope of their call has increased. God wants them to go beyond the boundaries of what they are operating on right now. Maybe it's not just the local church, but God has it for them to go beyond the local church, go to the nations. Maybe it's an itinerating thing. God was equipping them. Now he's launching them into that. So be aware of that. Right? Um, sometimes we let go because um, despite repeated corrections, despite being patient, um, they're not able to or they don't want to. Okay, So they're not able to. We provide opportunities to learn. Uh, opportunities to increase the skills, etc. Uh, then they come to a place where they they don't want to. Right? Um, I don't want to contribute. I don't want to do that. Then, um, then there needs to come to a place of you know you being faithful to the task, faithful to the organization. The right thing to do then it's to it's to let go. Okay, so uh, we look at a little bit of that um, in the in the next class, and also. Uh, look at the next one, which is conflict resolution. So I think we'll just kind of flow into that. OK, so we'll stop here for today. Um, God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pat. Right, God bless. Bye-bye.